Oh, don't you thank God every day for the greatest pastor and pastor's wife, pastor and sister Booker, and their children, and the greatest bishop and his wife. Praise God. Amen. And uh, we love your pastor and so so uh, highly esteem him and his daddy and all the matriarchs of the family and all the offspring and the siblings and uh, the youth leader, praise God. And even Brother Pierce, Brother Adam Pierce. <laughs> and uh, he is my friend. And uh, my earliest recollection of him goes back to Santa Maria, late 80s. I think it was my first and last senior uh, camp, praise God. I think it might have been yours, too. <laughs> God's been good to you and I, praise God. That's all I can say. God's been merciful to you and I. <laughs> But I love uh, Pastor Booker so much. He is my family's pastor, and uh, we're very happy about that. And we're happy for all of you, praise God. And we love all of you. And I want us to pray that God's perfect will would be done. I'm not long-winded, but uh, God's perfect will would be done. If you would pray, God, your will be done. In Jesus' name, God, we really do pray. Lord, whatever you want taught, preached, God, your will be done in the next few minutes. Lord, we pray that you would open a great and effectual door of utterance. Open a great and effectual door of utterance and get us through that door in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to dive off into the deep end, praise God. And uh, we... uh, sang that song, It's All in Him, and there was part of that verse, as you pick up where it talks about the Messiah, King and Priest, how many picked up on that, King and Priest, let's focus on that, praise God, go to 1 Corinthians 11, and uh, I'm going to try, by God's grace, to stick to the notes, so we can get out of here to get Brother Pierce to bed, praise God, he gets up with the chickens, hallelujah, and uh, He's got to be at work at 5 in the morning. So I'm always trying to be mindful of that. Uh, but uh, I can't say enough how much I love Pastor Booker. He is my hero, praise God. Now, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And then he begins to talk about Christ, man, woman, etc., prophesying hair. But drop down to verse 23. For I, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Everybody say bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Two of the cardinal teachings of God's Word that deserve careful, prayerful scrutiny and examination are communion and foot washing. And uh, tonight, we're not going to do communion and we're not going to do foot washing. But we are going to deal with a man from way back in the book of Genesis by the name of Melchizedek. Everybody say Melchizedek. And uh, we're going to deal with... Jesus Christ, the Messiah, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Lord Jesus, give us illumination, give us revelation, give us understanding of this great mysterious truth, Lord. Give us understanding, Jesus, and tie it all together. Make it apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. You can be seated. Communion has its roots in the Old Testament. 
The Passover was an event that took place in Exodus 12 and 13. Israel had been in Egyptian bondage for 430 years. God heard their cries for deliverance, so he sent Moses to Egypt, empowered Moses to do the biggest jailbreak in human history, and God worked many notable miracles through Moses, the plagues, etc. But as God was preparing to unleash the last plague on Egypt, the plague of the death angel passing through Egypt, killing the firstborn of every family, God first commands the Israelites to apply the blood of a lamb to their homes in order to escape the plague of death. And so God commanded Israel to keep the first Passover to escape the judgment of God. Then God commanded Israel to annually keep the Passover feast as a memorial of their deliverance from Egypt, which is a type of sin. And so the lamb had to be uh, fastened up from the 10th day to the 14th day of the month. The lamb had to be without blemish, had to be a male of the first year, had to be roasted. It couldn't be eaten raw or boiled. The lamb had to be eaten in its entirety along with bitter herbs. They had to keep the lamb whole. In other words, they couldn't break a bone of that lamb. If a household was too small to eat the entire lamb, they were to invite neighbors over because the entire lamb had to be eaten. They were then to apply the blood of the lamb to the lintel above the door and on the two side posts, but not on the threshold. The Israelites were to eat the lamb fully dressed, ready to travel. They were to eat it in haste, God said, with their loins girded, shoes on, staff in hand, ready to go. Amen. Anybody ready to go up in the rapture? Woo, praise God, it's going to happen. It could be tonight. And then you won't have to get up so early tomorrow, Brother Pierce. They were to put, they were to get rid of all leaven from their house during this uh, week. They were to eat unleavened bread for seven days thereafter. The Israelites were not to work on the day of the Passover. And so Passover, God said, it will be observed in the month uh, Nisan or Nisan, I've heard it pronounced both ways, also known as Ahib, uh, and uh, that would be, of course, March uh, to April, somewhere in that range. Strangers, or Abib, Abib, or, or Bev, I've heard him pronounce it Abib. I don't speak Hebrew, so the, you that speak Hebrew, praise God. God bless you for that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Strangers could eat the Passover. Everybody say if. The males submitted to circumcision. And then servants and slaves, God said, could also eat the Passover if they too submitted to circumcision. The Passover lamb had to be eaten in one house. It could not be carried from house to house or from place to place. One law, everybody everybody say one law, was applicable to everybody. One law. Both to the home-born and to strangers. If they were to eat the Passover lamb, they had to embrace the one law of God. Failing to observe the Passover was a major sin. Numbers 9, but the man that is clean and is not in a journey and forbeareth to keep the Passover, even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people. Because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season, that man shall bear his sin. I actually pastored one time, my first pastorate. Uh, a family, it was communion night, and they, they said, we can't be there. we got to stay home and, and babysit the dog. And the scripture that came to me, that scripture talks about breaking uh, the neck of a donkey, and, and, and it just sent eebie-jeebies up and down my spine. I'm thinking, we're doing the most sacred sacrament in the year, and they're staying home because of the dog. They both walked out on God eventually, and they were elderly. Amen. I, I, so we want to understand this, this, the sacredness of holy things. This is a holy God, and he institutes holy things. Praise God. And so God said, you're going to observe the Passover unless you're on a journey. And then he said the, the Passover, God specified the location it would be uh, taking place, where 
it would need to take place. Deuteronomy 16, God said, Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates. You don't take it at home on your own. He said, Which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place, the place, which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in. There. I had another lady. Uh, this is, I'm not airing out all the dirty laundry. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I promise you I'm not doing that. None of this is in my nose. It's just popping in my head, so maybe it'll help you. We took communion one night. And one lady, she said, Pastor, I didn't come tonight. I decided to take it at home. Well, she was going into isolationism. So we're all at the church taking Passover, communion, and she's at home on her own, and she ended up walking out on God. And so this subject we're dealing with, Jesus Christ, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, a priest forever. There's something deep and profound. We're dealing with the most mysterious man in the Bible, Melchizedek, praise God, which we haven't got there yet. But Jesus specifies the location. It's where my name will be. It's going to be where the people of God gather together. That's where you're going to observe this. And so the driving message of the Bible, literally from the book of Genesis all the way to the the book of Revelation, the foundational book all the way to the capstone book of Revelation, the driving message is the, the, the coming of the Messiah, the death, burial, resurrection of the Messiah. The whole Bible is Christ-centered. One of the rules of hermeneutics, one of the principles of interpretation. You have all these principles of interpreting God's Word, and God's Word tells us what those rules are. And one of those uh, methods, one of those principles is this. All of the Scripture is pointing to Jesus, 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 Jesus. He's king and he's priest. He's the I am. He's God. There's none like him, beside him, before him, after him. Aren't you glad you know who Jesus is? Praise God. Oh, he's so good, so great, so kind. And so there's uh, all of the types and shadows in the Old Testament all pointing to Christ. And so it's interesting that the Bible, God said after he got them out of Egypt through this, uh, this great night, the tenth plague, God then says, Israel, every year you're going to observe the Passover. Well, we only have ten specific accounts in the Word of God where they actually did this. I'm sure they, they did this every year, per, but maybe they didn't during one of those crazy kings uh, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Manasseh. I'm sure he probably didn't do this uh, until the very end of his life when he repented and got right with God. But we have ten specific accounts of the celebration of Passover. Number one, the original Passover, Exodus 12. Number two, the Passover in the wilderness in Numbers 9. Number three, the first Passover in Canaan, Joshua 5. Number four, the Passover under King Hezekiah. 2 Chronicles 30, number 5, the Passover under King Josiah, 2 Chronicles 35. Number 6, the Passover under Zerubbabel, Ezra 6. Number 7, the Passover Jesus attended as a child in Luke 2. Number 8, the first Passover during Jesus' public ministry is recorded in John 2. Number 9, the second Passover during Jesus' ministry in In John 6, and then the 10th final Passover mention is the last Passover. During Jesus' ministry in Matthew 26, the night of his betrayal, the night of his arrest, it's also known as the Last Supper, during which time Jesus institutes the communion service. Now, let's go to the mystery man, Melchizedek. And so let me uh, summarize for you Genesis 14. We're going back to Genesis 14. Every major doctrine, every major doctrine is in seed form in the book of Genesis. Genesis is is the seed plot of the whole Bible. And so uh, Father Abraham has 318 servants. They go against four nations with his 318 ragtag army. They go against four nations, and they win the battle. Abraham is coming back from the battle, and out of nowhere in Genesis 14, 18 is where we'll pick this up. Out of nowhere, Genesis 14, 18, comes this mystery man named Melchizedek. He literally walks out of nowhere. 
And the Bible says in Genesis 14, 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is the root word in Jerusalem, brought forth bread and wine, which are the sacraments of the communion service. He brought bread and he brought wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he, he being Melchizedek, blessed him. Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he, the he here is Abraham, gave him, that is Melchizedek, Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes, everybody say tithes, of all, that's 10%. Tithes always go up, tithes don't go down, right? Pastor Booker's not going to pay tithes to me. I'm going to pay tithes to him because he's like way up there and I'm like way down here, praise God. (laughs) But really, that's how it works. Tithes go up. I'm not going to bless Pastor Booker. I pray he blesses me, hallelujah. How many wants Pastor to bless you? We're not going to go lay hands on. I'm not going to go lay my hands on Pastor Booker during the altar service tonight. Pastor Booker, come here, I'm going to lay my hands on you. No, but I hope he lays hands on me. Because the blessing comes top down, ties go bottom up. Ties means 10%. The point is this, Melchizedek, pastor knows this, Melchizedek is big time in the Bible. The most mysterious man in the Bible is Melchizedek. So this mysterious, the Bible says he is both a king and a priest. He's both. He literally steps out of nowhere coming from this place called Salem, which will later no doubt be the Jerusalem. And he comes out of nowhere. He locks eyes with Abraham. I'm telling you, listen to me. Abraham's big time in the Bible. How many knows Abraham's big time? I mean like big time. Christians call Abraham their father. Muslims call Abraham their father. Jews call Abraham their father. Abraham's big time. He's the friend of God. But I'm going to tell you, bigger time than Abraham is Melchizedek. You say, well, who is he? Well, Dr. Nathaniel J. Wilson says he's a theophany. I think he does. Brother Steve Waldron doesn't believe he is. I think I'm going to go with Dr. Wilson on this one. Praise God. You too? Okay, we've got that together. Me and Pastor. Now, whatever Pastor says goes. Praise God. (laughs) And so some believe that Melchizedek was a theophany, literally, a God in a temporary, visible form. How many remembers when Abraham's sitting out in front of his tent and he looks up and he sees three men? The Bible calls them men. You remember that story? And Abraham recognizes, because he's a spiritual man, these are not ordinary men. He jumps up, he waves to them, come over here. And those three men come over there. And he's recognizing these are not normal men. Well, in fact, two of them were angels, and the third was Jehovah God. They were in a a temporary body called a theophany. It was temporary. God did not take on a permanent body until he overshadowed Mary. Jesus was more than a theophany. Jesus was Jehovah God, God the Father, in real, authentic, genuine flesh. But that, I lo- let me tell you why I like that story. How many wants to know why I like that story? Because Abraham says to his wife, Wife, kill the fatted cow, get some milk, get some butter, and get some bread. And Jehovah God, with two of his angels, sat down and ate meat, praise God, bread with butter and milk. Don't be offended, but God is not vegan, praise God. Not in that chapter right there, he's not, praise God. Now, I know during the millennium, we're all going to be vegetarians. And I know, okay, listen, let's get off that subject. We're going to wade out into the deep end, never get back. Don't get offended by that. It's someone I love very, very, very much is vegan, so... There's nothing wrong with it. Just don't forbid me not to eat meat and don't forbid me not to get married, praise God. (laughs) Now, everybody say Melchizedek. Comes out of nowhere and he's got a loaf of bread in one hand 
He's got wine and the other fruit juice. He gives them to Abraham. He blesses Abraham, and Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek. And so you have the elements of the Lord's table. Melchizedek literally comes out of nowhere. And then he, after he blesses Abraham, receives tithes from Abraham, he's given the bread and he's given the wine, which we partake of at the Lord's table. I believe it was uh, wine. There has many uh, Hebrew words that it can apply to. I believe there it's literally the fruit of the vine. And then he, he, he does all this, Melchizedek, turns on his heels, and he walks out into the desert, and he disappears for a thousand years. Praise God. And so, this, this idea of typology, I know you're familiar with it. Whenever we uh, come across a type, a type is a pointer in the Old Testament. When Moses was smiting that rock, that rock Paul said was Christ. That rock typified Christ. And, and there's all this typology, that brazen serpent, serpent that was put on that pole. And if you got bit by a snake in numbers, if you looked to that serpent, if you locked eyes with that brazen serpent, you would be instantly healed. Well, that brazen serpent uh, was a pointer, a type, a foreshadowing of Messiah. Jesus took that scripture and applied it to himself. And he talks about Moses and the serpent. And then he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He was talking about what he would do as the Messiah, praise God. And so Melchizedek, this mysterious king priest, is the ultimate. Melchizedek is the ultimate and perfect type of Jesus Christ. So get the picture here. Melchizedek walks out of nowhere carrying bread and wine, blesses Abraham, receives tithes from Abraham, turns around and walks off the pages of Scripture for a thousand years. Now the next time he appears is in Psalms 110. And Pastor taught on this Sunday morning. Go to Psalms 110, verse 4. The Lord hath sworn... And will not repent. God made an oath. And I'm going to tell you, when God makes an oath, you can take it to the bank. He will not change his mind. The Lord hath sworn, will not repent. And here's the prophecy. Thou, and this is a messianic prophecy, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that name Melchizedek, has not appeared for a 1,000 years. From Genesis to Psalms is a 1,000 years. And so the priesthood of the coming Messiah will be like the priesthood of Melchizedek. And then Melchizedek disappears again for another 1,000 years until he appears in the book of Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Everybody got your Bibles? If not, they can put it on the screen, whatever your custom is. Hebrews chapter 5. That's not potato chips. That's the Bible, praise God. Actually had a later lady one time, Pastor. This is <laughs> things that pop in your head when you're teaching, huh? Just crazy stuff. I was up one morning, this is at North Calvary, and I looked out, and there was a lady out there eating potato chips. And I seen Sister Dylan out there. God bless you, Sister Dylan. Love Sister Dylan. Praise God. And uh, is that her? Is Sister Dylan out there? That is you, right? Is she not here? Oh, oh my, I thought that was your mama. <laughs> Tell her I said that. She's going to get a kick out of that. Oh, this is funny now. Now, this is, now I'm getting really old, praise God. I've got bad eyesight up close. Now I got it far away, my dear precious wife. Is that you, my wife? I thought that was your mama sitting back there. Now, okay, your brother Andy will remember this, I believe. But I looked out there one service, and there was a lady out there eating potato chips. But I said, self, she needs the Holy Ghost. She needs to be baptized in Jesus' name. Be careful how you handle this. Handle this one with a velvet glove. So I did. Come to find out, she was a little simple. 
but she repented, Pastor. She got the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Jesus' name, and within a month or two, she was dead. Well, I'm glad the ushers didn't do stupid that night, praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Now, what's that got to do with Melchizedek? Everything. Because nobody repents and nobody gets the baptized in Jesus' name, and nobody gets the Holy Ghost, if it hadn't been for Jesus Christ, the Messiah, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. See how it all ties in? Now, Melchizedek will show up in the book of Hebrews. This is wild. Nine times he shows up in the book of Hebrews. It's like the Holy Ghost just pulls out the mysterious gun and just starts blasting. Bah, 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 bah. Melchizedek, Melchizedek, Melchizedek. I'm telling you, Melchizedek is big time in the Bible. Go to Hebrews 5, 6. <laughs> As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 5, 10, called of God an high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 6, 20 whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 verse 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, he's both king, and then it says priest of the most high God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Hebrews 7 10, for he, talking about Levi, And all of the Levites that would make up the Levitical priesthood, for he, the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. That's big time right there. Hebrews 7, 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. Look at verse 15, Hebrews 7, 15, and verse 16. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal, which means fleshly commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Look at 7, 17. For he testifieth. The psalmist, the prophet David, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then the last one is Hebrews 7.21. For those priests, all those Old Testament priests, were made without an oath. Talking about an oath from God. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. He's not going to change his mind. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God's mind on this matter will never change, is what this says. God's promises are unchangeable. They're sealed with an oath. And so all throughout Hebrews, the Holy Ghost is letting us know, what is Hebrews all about? It's the Holy Ghost letting us know that Jesus Christ is better, yea, infinitely better. He's infinitely better than the angels. Jesus is infinitely better than the angels in so much and so far. He's worshiped by the angels. Jesus is better than Moses, which is big time if you're a Jew. Jesus is better than Joshua. This is what Hebrews teaches. Jesus is better than the Mosaic law, all of it. Jesus is a better sanctuary, a better sacrifice, a better messenger with a greater message. He's offering a better rest slash Sabbath with a better covenant. Jesus is better. This is what Hebrews is all about. Jesus is better than the Levitical priesthood because Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Praise God. Now, here are the facts. Are you with me out there? (laughs) Are you hanging in there? We don't always deal with Melchizedek. So when we deal with it, you got to be like mentally sipping coffee, praise God. Unless you're sipping Holy Ghost, and then you're really stimulated, hallelujah. Here are the facts about Aaron's Levitical priesthood. Remember, Father Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had how many sons? Twelve. 
And the oldest was Reuben. Then came Simeon. Then who was the third? Levi, right? And then Judah, the fourth. Levi, from Levi will come the priest. Are you with me? Here are the facts about Aaron's Levitical priesthood. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Levi, the facts about Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood. Here are the facts. Firstly, this is what the Bible teaches. Aaron's priesthood was national. It was Judaistic. Number two, Aaron's priesthood was subject to royalty. All right? But Melchizedek's priesthood was royalty. Oh, this is something. Four times the Bible says that Melchizedek, four times in the Word of God it says Melchizedek was a king. He was royalty. He wasn't just a priest. He was a king. Hebrews 7, 1 says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem. Hebrews 7, 2, king of righteousness, he's called. Then he's called king of Salem again. Then he's called king of peace. Anybody met the king of peace? Praise God. <laughs> Woo. And then, so you have four times in two verses in Hebrews, it says that Melchizedek's priesthood was royalty, which was not the case with Aaron's priesthood, which was strictly national, and it was not royalty. There was never that combination in the Old Testament. There was never in the Old Testament a king-priest until King Jesus showed up. Now, in the, I, I said there was never a, a, a priest that was also a king in the Old Testament, except for Melchizedek, that is. And so Israel's priesthood was never both king and priest. I'm thinking back to when Brother Philip was leading songs. It's all in him. It's all in him. Then it's talking about when he comes back, he will be both king and priest. What? Did someone just make up those words? No. That's what the message is in the Bible. The perfect sacrifice is God in flesh, and he's both king and priest. Furthermore, he's judge, hallelujah, and he's prophet, and he's the creator, and he's the great I am, and he's good, and he's great. Hey, and by the way, he's my father, and he's my daddy, hallelujah. Remember in Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back on that white horse? The Bible says that on his head are many crowns, pow. And then it says his, his vesture is like it's been dipped in blood. And then it says when he gets off that white horse, that's going to uh, inaugurate the thousand-year reign of the Messiah here on earth. And it says that he's going to rule this earth with a rod of iron. He's not coming back as a bad, bad lamb, meek and mild and lowly. He's coming back as a roaring lion. Listen, I don't do horses. I don't like horses. Horses don't like me. I don't like horses. But this is one situation I want to be involved in. I want to be on one of them horses behind the Messiah. How about you? <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm going to learn how to ride a horse. But the Bible says at the end of Revelation 19 that on his vesture is written, say it with me, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, both priest and king. Oh, I'm glad I know who Jesus is. I think we ought to love him just for a moment. We ought to, he's both king and priest. Hallelujah. Oh, he's so good, so great, so kind, so loving, so merciful. And so the third thing about the Aaronic priesthood, it offered, this is huge. The Aaronic Levitical priesthood did not offer a permanent righteousness of peace. It never established a permanent righteousness for man, nor a permanent peace with God. The fourth thing about the Aaronic Levitical priesthood, it was hereditary. If you were born in the right family with the right blood, you came through uh, Levi, and in particular Aaron, uh, you were automatically a priest, no matter what kind of character you had. Fifthly, Aaron's priesthood was a timed priesthood. The Old Testament priest could only serve from ages 25 to 50. And then it was over. It was limited by time. Aaron's priesthood was a national priesthood, Subject to kings, it offered no permanent righteousness and peace. It was hereditary. It was limited by time. But Messiah's priesthood, 
Christ Melchizedekian priesthood supersedes, transcends, uh, overshadows, trumps, praise God, Aaron's in every imaginable possible way. Mel- Melchizedek's priesthood was universal. <laughs> it was not national. Whereas Aaron's priesthood was related just to Israel, Melchizedek's priesthood related to everybody everywhere, praise God. It was for all men. Judaism was a closed system that did not actually seek converts. The most horrible thing that could ever happen to a Jonah was for those crazy barbaric Assyrians to repent and for God to change his mind. And he was so angry about that. So when the Holy Ghost says that Jesus is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus is, in other words, both the priest. He is both priest and king. But he's not just priest to Israel. He's the priest to the whole world. That includes us wild barbarians in Southern California. Aren't you thankful for that? Praise God. Oh, God is so good. And so Psalms 110, the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. God will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so this messianic prophecy tells us that the Messiah, he will be priest. He will have a perpetual, permanent, forever priesthood. The Messiah will not be of the established line of priests in the tribe of Levi. He's not a Levite. He comes from Jacob's fourth son, Judah, through Leah. (laughs) And then the psalmist is letting us know the Messiah will be both priest and king. The, The Messiah, furthermore, the Messiah will have no successor in office. Hebrews 10, 12, but this man... After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. There were no chairs. There were no seats in the holy place. And there were no seats in the holy of holies. Those priests were in there barefoot and they never sat down. But the Messiah... Priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, he offered one sacrifice, his body, and when he ascended into heaven after his resurrection, he sat down forever. When Jesus said, it is finished, it is finished. Praise God. And so his priesthood, Messiah's priesthood, is Melchizedekian. It's universal, it's royal, it's personal, it's eternal. It brings about righteousness and peace. Praise God. What does this mean to you and I? What hope is there for me in this? Well, I'm going to tell you. Let me tell you. Let me just tell you the way it is. You're looking at a piece of work right here. My wife will tell you all about that. (laughs) Am I looking at a piece of work out there? Anybody still have Messiah working on you? (laughs) Uh, anybody have bad days besides me? Anybody ever have problems with your flesh? Anybody ever ever have problems with your attitude? Anybody ever have problems with your emotions? You know, uh, musicians start coming up here because we, we gotta we gotta really start tightening up now. Praise God. This gives us this gives us a false hope. There are at least five, I think, prophetic portraits to the Old Testament tabernacle plan. The Old Testament tabernacle plan, which was later replaced by the temple. Number one, number one, it points to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in every way. All seven pieces of furniture. The altar, the laver, the menorah, the the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the ark of the covenant, the mercy seat. It's all about Jesus, 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 Jesus. A priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's the first prophetic portrait. Second 
prophetic portrait, all of the tabernacle points to the plan of salvation. You've got the death, the burial, and the resurrection all in the tabernacle plan. It's all types and shadows. The third prophetic portrait of the tabernacle plan, it points to a location. Boy, and I want to be there, Pastor. I want to be there. Pastor, I pray about this every single day, this part right here, every day. The tabernacle plan, if you were to fly over the tabernacle, those seven pieces of furniture, if you were to fly over and could look in the holy place, and, and of course, the, the, you have the outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies, that furniture was in the shape of a cross, which shows a vertical connection we've got to have. We call that the anointing, vertically un- connected to God. But there's a horizontal part to it all. I've got to be right with you, and you've got to be right with me. I called Pastor Bishop Booker, your daddy, about seven years ago. And I said, talk to me about Psalms 133. Seven years ago, almost seven and a half years ago. And your dad, it's got three verses. talks about the anointing oil that came down Aaron's beard, went down. And it talks about the unity of the brethren and the anointing. The unity, unity, that's horizontal. And the anointing oil. The anointing oil always goes from top down. Whoo, this excites me. This both excites me and puts the fear of God in me at the same time. Because I got one shot at life, and I don't want to miss it. And there's only one location that I want to be. It doesn't matter where I'm at geographically. I mean, it, it matters, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what my mental state is or my, my financial state. It, it, no, no, no. There's one location that I want to be. Psalms 133 talks about the anointing oil coming down. And the unity of the brethren. And your dad said the key words in Psalms 133, the two words that are most significant for there. What's for there? It's the intersection place of anointing and unity. And when we get positioned correctly, when I'm hooked up right with God and I'm hooked up right with you, it's there and it's only there that God commands the blessing. Listen, having the favor of God is everything. If I don't have the favor of God, nothing else matters but you listen to me brothers and sisters and friends if I have the favor of God nothing else matters stretch your hands toward heaven just for a moment I want to be in that intersection place right with God and right with man Right with God and right with my family. Right with God and right with pastor. Right with God and right with my boss at work. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Oh, you can stand, praise God. The the fourth prophetic portrait of the tabernacle plan, it's a, it's a, It teaches us how to pray. Whenever we're praying, worshiping, fellowshipping with God, we're somewhere in that tabernacle, praise God. But let me tell you about the fifth prophetic portrait. This rocks my world. I started to make the whole message just this fifth point right here. But the, the fifth prophetic portrait of the tabernacle plan, it's a portrait prophetically of you and I. The tabernacle plan typifies the human in all of his and her complexities. Jesus said, destroy this temple, I will raise it again. And it says in that scripture that he was talking about his body. Paul said, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. There were three parts to the tabernacle plan. The outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies. And we also have three parts. 
And separating the outer court from the holy place, there were five pillars, much like these pillars here, not quite as big as those. And, and there was a curtain hanging on those, which that curtain hanging on those five pillars separated the holy place from the outside world. Those five pillars point to our five senses. That's how we interact with the world. And the two primary sensory organs that are affecting us the most are our eyesight and our hearing. That's why we need to remember that little kid's song we learned in Sunday school. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Ears, what you hear. Because it has a major effect on us. And then when you came into the holy place, you have the menorah. You've got the altar of incense. You've got the table of showbread. That points to the middle part of us. This is where the battle is won or lost. It's our psyche. The outer part is soma. It points to our body, how we interact with the world. Then we have a mind, which the Bible also calls it the heart, a soul. And between the holy of holies where the ark of the covenant is and the mercy seat, there is four pillars upon which another veil hung. That's the veil when Christ said it is finished. That veil was rent in two. But those four pillars, they, they point to the four pillars of our mind. We're made of soma psyche. Some people think I'm psycho. And sometimes I am, praise God. And sometimes you are too, hallelujah. We better know what to do when we're going psycho. What are the four pillars that make up our mind? We have a pillar called emotions. We have a pillar called intellect. We have a pillar called what? Conscience. We have another pillar that's called our human what? Will. How many knows you got a will? And then into the Holy of Holies, that points to Numa, our spirit. What did Paul say? I don't know if we can pull it up. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I don't have this in these notes, but I, maybe we can pull it up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I don't know, it's somewhere towards the end. He says, verse 23, And the very God of peace, whoo, sanctify you wholly, which means completely in totality. And I pray God your whole spirit, Numa, and what? Soul, your psyche, your emotions, your will, your conscience, your intellect. And then he says, and your what? Your body, your eyes, your ears, every organ in your body. Be preserved, what? Blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the message here right now? When Adam ate the hand grenade and he bit down on that thing, there was an implosion. And those five pillars and those four innermost pillars, his emotions, his psyche, his will, his intellect, they went crazy. That's why I need Jesus Christ preached forever after the order of Melchizedek I need his spirit inside of me because what was once a chamber of life before Adam ate the hand grenade when he bit down it became a chamber of death and until I get Jesus Christ the Holy Ghost inside of me and he starts working from the inside out can I just bring this to a close God's therapy brother Wilson taught us this God's therapy is what? The Lord's Prayer. You ever hear him teach on that? It's powerful. God's therapy is the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to tell you what else God's therapy is. It's the Word of God. I, there was no door. You can start walking down here slowly. We're going to pray. In, 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 if you just want to start making your way down here real slow. There was no door from the outside directly into the Holy of Holies. There was no door there. God said there's not. The only way you can get from the outside, the body, into the Holy of Holies, you had to go through the psyche. But there's a problem. There's a barrier. Because those pillars that make up my mind, my psyche, my, my intellect, my emotions, my will, and my conscience, 
They act as impediments, barriers to what God's wanting to do. So how am I going to get those pillars vertical so they're no longer impediments to me and the Spirit of God can flow through my life? How do I get those pillars vertical? The Bible says in Psalms, He sent His what? His Word, and He what? Healed them. Amen. I'm going to bring this to a close right here. Then we're going to sing a song in worship. Last thing. Everybody say, I have a significant other. All you young men, you've got a significant other. It may be a girlfriend. It may be that mirror right there Pastor or Brother Pierce was preaching about last week. <laughs> but everybody has a significant other. When you was a boy, it might have been a mom, a dad, a grandpa, a grandma. Cooley, a sociologist, gave this to us many decades ago. He called it Cooley's Looking Glass Self. Everybody has a mirror. There, and as we grow up in life, that mirror can change. And it used to be my mommy. Then it became uh, my wife. And, and, and significant others can change. A significant other, that's the most important person in your life. It can become, a, a, it can be a movie star, a singer, an NFL player. But the point of it is, is that significant other, however they see me, is the way I see me. And that's the power of this concept. Listen, huh. every day I need to be looking into the perfect law of liberty. James called the Word of God the mirror, and he called it the perfect law of liberty. Anybody have hang-ups here? Anybody feel tweaked at times, emotionally distraught and messed up? The Spirit of God, the Word of God, amen, prayer and the Word and the pastor in my life teaching and preaching to me the Word, that's how I get fixed. And all of this is made possible. All of this is made possible and accessible to us because God the Father robed himself in flesh. Jesus Christ the Messiah, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, hallelujah. I think we ought to stretch our hands as pastor comes. Stretch our hands as high as we can. Let the Holy Ghost flow right now. Before we leave here tonight, we need to touch heaven, touch God. Jesus Christ priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, hallelujah. I need God. 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 Anybody feel your need for God? That's it. The Holy Ghost is here right now. We've heard from God. Come on, let's feel after him. Let the word speak to us now. Come on, let's respond to the word. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. That's it. Come on, lift your voice. Talk to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.